Uh, while you're still looking for Luke 11, maybe you're there already, a couple more announcements. I really want to emphasize the baptism. Some of you perhaps uh, have come to faith in Christ in recent days um, and have never been baptized, at least since then. The New Testament pattern is very clear. Beloved, that people are baptized after they've come to faith in Christ. And uh, this is a unique opportunity to say, I'm going to identify with Jesus just like he identified with me. Uh, in his baptism, he was identifying with sinners. We get the privilege in baptism to identify with him, uh, to express the outwardly the reality that's happened within us. And if you haven't done that, I hope you will. We got about a half a dozen signed up right now. And uh, so we got plenty of room for more. The Baptist Church, just two blocks down, is where we do this because they have a baptistry and we don't. Uh, but it works well that way. And they're very gracious, Pastor Mike and the uh, trustees over there. So please let me know if you would like to be involved in that as well. Also, please save September 26th and 27th Family Matters Seminar. More information as we get closer, but that's a Saturday and a Sunday. I want to make sure that you're putting that on your calendar now so that you don't uh, you come up short when the time comes when we get more information. But in the next two or three months, we'll be having more information on that. But please save the dates in the meantime. Will you stand with me as we read from Luke 11? <clears throat> I'm beginning this morning in verse 24. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest. And finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. But he said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Father, as we humble ourselves before you this morning and before the precious word that you have given us. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. We pray that you will minister the word in a powerful way in our hearts. Lord, cause our minds to cease from the distractions that pour up on us, all the things that we can think about that are going wrong at home or wrong at work or wrong somewhere else. And help us in these moments to concentrate on everything that's right with you. And I pray that that will change us from the inside out. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We're in a brief two week series titled Escape from the Evil Empire. We looked last week at verses 14 through 23. Some of you think we're really rushing through all of a sudden. We'll slow down again sooner or later. But. Uh, we are chewing off a few verses at a time. But last week we saw that the entire universe of spiritual reality is made up of two, two kingdoms. There's God's kingdom of light, and there is Satan's domain of darkness. Those are the two kingdoms. And due to the fall of Adam, we all are born into the domain of darkness. You don't have to do anything to be part of that. You just are when you are born. And so there has to be a change that comes about. It turns out that only the grace of God can remove us from that kingdom. We can't do that on our own. And so there has to be a savior. And as we looked at that passage, we saw five principles Saw the first three last week from these two passages that we're looking at. First one was that evil does not cast out evil. You don't get God's blessing by shortcuts, by accommodation, by compromise. And so our thoughts that we know better than God and that our view of things, which is more up-to-date after all, than his ancient commands, our view is better. We will always find that that doesn't work because evil does not cast out evil. It just brings 
more problems. The second principle we saw was that victory requires a savior, a stronger man. He gave the analogy of a strong man keeping his house and holding everything in place. And only a stronger man can come in and remove the, and deliver from the bondage that's going on. Third principle was neutrality is fatal. Everyone must make a decision. No decision is a decision to stay in the domain of darkness. And so a decision is necessary. Now today we want to look at two more principles in the verses that we've just read. These are principles that contrast the two main ways that people try to move from the domain of darkness to God's kingdom of light. The first one is by moral reformation. Moral reformation, meaning by being good. I think I can move from darkness to light by being good. And so that's my first attempt. The second is spiritual transformation. Spiritual transformation. The moral reformation sounds good. It's attractive. It's the thing that our, our natural tendency goes toward. But beloved, it does not work. It's what this passage is teaching us. It's like the woman who went to a, you know, a self-help seminar of some kind, and she came away saying, wow, my life was changed 360 degrees. Come on now, come on. <laughs> you all know 360 degrees is a full circle, right? If you've changed 360 degrees, you're right back where you started. You may have had some movement in the meantime, but you've made no true change. And that's what moralism does. That's where it leads us. Moral reformation is outward. Spiritual transformation begins inward and works outward. Moral reformation is our work. Spiritual transformation is God's work. So let's take a look at those two things as they are presented in this passage. First of all, it's not about moral reformation. Jesus has already told us in the previous few verses that a strong man must have a stronger man come along to remove someone from bondage or something from the bondage. But now in this passage, he raises a kind of a fascinating scenario. He proposes that someone might be freed from de demon possession, but then be reinvaded. So the demon comes back and takes over again. And so he says that the last state of that person is worse than the first in verse 26. Now, I mean, that's a dire warning, right? That ought to get our ears really perked up, get our undivided attention. What could lead to a tragedy like that? That you think you're rid of the demon, but the demon is back. And Jesus gives almost a bizarre answer to that question in verse 24. He says, when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. Now, if you're like me, you're asking yourself, what in the world does it mean this demon passes through waterless places? And if you're like me, you would go check, start checking commentaries, which is what I did. I checked somewhere between 30 and 40 commentaries. And what I can tell you is that every single commentator has a different idea on what that passage means. So, you'll have to take what I believe it means. Now, the, the, the interesting thing is, you know, this is, you, you should be glad that you have an expository preacher, right? Because if I wasn't an expository preacher, I just would ignore that passage, right? I just let it go. But, but, but I can't do that. If I did that, somebody would come up to me after the service and say, I thought you were an expository preacher. I thought you went verse by verse and word by word. Why didn't you deal with that? So I'm going to deal with that. I'm going to give you my best take on it. I'm going to give you my best guess. And whether it's absolutely correct or not, 
I think is close enough to tell us what we need to know. What are waterless places? They're deserts, right? They're arid places. They're places where there's no water, where there's no ability to produce fruit, where there's no life. And what I think Jesus is suggesting here is that because demons work in this world through bodies, they need and they want physical bodies. We saw that in Luke 8 where the, where the, where the demons are excused to go into the pigs, as you'll recall that this demon has been released. It's gone out in quest of a new place to reside and it's not been able to find any place that it can exercise its malicious intent on the world. It's come up dry. And so it says to itself, well, I think I'll just go back to the place that I came from. I will return to my house from which I came. Now notice that it calls the place from which he came my house. That's one of the first keys to understanding this passage. Even though he left and is coming back, he still calls it his house. Though it's left, it hasn't given up ownership. There's been no change in ownership in this life. And that's why he says in verses 25 and 26, and when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the end is worse than the beginning. Now, what does it mean, swept and put in order? This obviously is speaking of moral reform. Moral reform. This is a person saying, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to stop the, the behaviors and the things that have gotten me in trouble in the past. I'm going to leave aside the lying, the cheating, the misrepresenting in my business, whatever. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. This is like 10 years of New Year's resolutions all put into effect at one time. I'm sweeping the place out. But there's a problem. While this life has been swept clean of some of the evil habits and destructive behaviors that have been part of its past, there's been nothing to replace what has been swept out. There's no heart change. This is just about me trying to improve myself. The demon is gone, but God has not been invited in. This is a life that's still living as though God didn't matter or didn't exist and is instead taking upon himself or herself to make the changes that are necessary. This goes back to the third principle, there's no neutrality. See, if, if God hasn't been invited in, then I'm still living whatever else, whatever else is influencing me, I'm still living on the basis of me. And the selfishness that associates with me, even at my very best, see, even at my very best, I'm still part of the evil empire. I'm, remember, I'm born into the domain of darkness. And so when I'm trying to sweep out, I haven't made an adequate change because I don't have Jesus in my life. Beloved, this is extremely real and it's what most people do. Most people go into moral reformation with the idea they can change their own life. Let me, let me tell you how the devil looks at this. The devil would say, I don't need to possess you, I just need you to possess you. That's all I need. I don't need to possess you. I just need you to possess you. I need you to think that you're the king of your life. I need you to stay on the throne. I need you to run your own domain. Now, let's make application of this. Because I think we could say, truthfully, that today we don't really look out and see a lot of demon-possessed people in our society, at least. They certainly exist in the world, and they exist in some cases even in our culture, but not often. But we still have three great enemies, right? We have the world, the flesh, and the devil. And while we, while we may not be demon-possessed, we are always demon-influenced. The devil is always at work. The demons are always at work through the world and through the flesh, and sometimes very directly. And salvation is not about doing better. It's not about being good. Salvation is about new ownership. 
Salvation is about new ownership. T turn with me to Luke 17. There's a great example there of what we're talking about. Jesus has just found 10 lepers and they call out to him and he sends them off to the priest, which would have been the required thing in their society to do. And as they turn to go toward the priest, they find themselves healed. But then we pick up in Luke 17 and verse 15. It says, then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now, he was a Samaritan. We'll talk about why Jesus mentions that when we get there, why Luke does. But then Jesus answered, we're not 10 cleansed. Where are the nine? Was no one found to return to give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, I realize that every single English version of this, or at least all the major English versions of this passage of Scripture, translate, your faith has made you well. But that's not what the original says. The original says, your faith has saved you. Sozo. It's the exact same word that's used in Ephesians 8, where Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. It's talking about spiritual salvation. And what Jesus is saying to this man is not your faith has made you well from your leprosy, but your faith has saved your very soul. And the reason that this man is returning when the others didn't is because they've been cleansed outwardly. They have been through a process that represents moral reformation. This man has been through a spiritual transformation and the change starts on the inside and then reflects itself outside as he comes back and finds himself at the feet of Jesus to give thanks for what has happened. The inward change has resulted in a genuine change in behavior. Now, back in Luke 11... Some have felt, in fact, if you go read a commentary on this, you may run into this. Many feel that what Jesus is talking about here is that he's making reference to the nation of Israel in Luke 11. And they would describe what he's doing there this way. They would say, well, idolatry was in the DNA of Israel going way back, right? For hundreds of years, they had practiced idolatry and God kept trying to bring them back and ask them to return, and they refused, and they refused. And so finally, God sent them into captivity to Babylon in 606 B.C. Remember that? And how for 70 years they were in captivity there. And that captivity did one thing. When a remnant came back to rebuild the city and to rebuild the temple and so on, there's one thing that they didn't do. They never went into idolatry again. But they also didn't return to God. And so they were sitting ducks when the Pharisees came along and said, it's all about moral reform. It's all about keeping the law. It's all, and, and, and particularly the law as defined by us. Because we got a version that you can actually keep. And that's what Israel was when Jesus came on the scene. And so, and so they, th those who take that position say the nation was about to reject their own Messiah so that the last state was going to be worse than the first because they were into moral reformation, not spiritual transformation, and that's what Jesus is trying to say here. That, that, is a, that is a good application of the passage, but that's not the center of what Jesus is saying here. This parable is aimed at individuals. And this parable is saying to us as individuals, you cannot reform yourself. You cannot individually escape the power of Satan. You can't. You must have a spiritual transformation. The stronger man has to do that. The evil must be replaced not by good, but by God. That's what has to happen in your life. Good behavior counts but only when it is an expression of love because, because you have already got Jesus in your life, not an expression of an effort 
to get him. Do you see the difference? It's a world of difference. Franz Kafka wrote a, wrote a book called The Trial. Some of you may have had to read it in college. Um, I doubt if it would have ever been a high school book, but the protagonist in this particular book is a man named Joseph. Joseph, Joseph wakes up on his 30th birthday, very happy to be having a birthday, feeling good about himself, only to find that there are soldiers at his door placing him under house arrest. So he asks, what's, what, what's going on? And they won't tell him. Nobody will tell him why he's under arrest. They just put him under arrest, won't let him go anywhere. And this goes on for days and then weeks. And he has, he, he never, nobody ever will tell him why this is happening. And he's incensed because he thinks of himself as a good person. He can't imagine what it was he, that, that he did that would cause this to happen. So he did what you and I would begin to do. He begins to think, what did I do? You know, did I forget to blink my lights at the corner yesterday? You know, what, what is it that's caused me to get into this trouble? And the more he thought about it, the more he was reminded of all the little dishonesties that had actually been part of his life all along. He began to realize the places where he had kind of misrepresented and told lies, the places where he had cut corners, the places where he had been dishonest with those that he was doing business with, the times when he had failed to help those in need. And before he got all done, he pretty well condemned himself. And he'd come to the realization that it wasn't a question of, of, of what he might have done that got them there, but it was simply a question of which, which thing might have brought them to his doorstep. Well, eventually in this book, the, the guard takes him out into a uh, rock quarry of some kind, and he looks up and he sees a figure in the far distance standing at the top, and his arms are outstretched, and he thinks, at last, someone will understand, someone will have mercy, and he, and he starts to reach out his hand toward that man, and just as he does that, the guard plunges a, a knife into his heart and kills him. Kafka says he died like a dog. That's how the book ends. Nice book, right? But it's making a point. The point is moral reformation leads to death. You can't redeem yourself, beloved. Even at our dead level best, we will sin enough in the next half hour to condemn us forever from the presence of God. Something, someone has to replace the evil that's where, thankfully, Christ comes into the picture, right? There is someone with arms outstretched. Someone whose arms were outstretched on the cross. Someone who took your place and mine on the cross. Someone who paid the price for our sins. Someone who, therefore, is willing and able and can be just and still offer justification to those of us who have sinned and cannot get out of this on our own. The stronger one is there. If we will only reach out to him, and so the first application here is to salvation, but there's also application here to those of us who are believers. I, I trust that's most of us here this morning. I'm always aware it's not all. I trust it's most, that we've really exercised saving faith in Christ. But the Bible is, I think, clear on this. A, a Christian person cannot be demon-possessed. The Holy Spirit and a demon cannot occupy the same space and you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit as a believer in Christ. The Bible teaches that over and over, but listen, we, are, we still have the same enemies. We still have the world, the flesh, and the devil. The world being that system of everything around us that tells us this is the way to go. This is the way to have fun. This is the way to live life. This is what's right. The flesh being that part that's in us inside of us saying, do this and you'll be happy, do that and you'll be happy, leading us down roads that we don't really want to go that are against the commandments of God and the devil being the, the, the demons behind us that are using all of those influences to pull us back into the old lifestyle, to get us back into the behaviors and the habits that we gave up when we came to Christ, that we turned our back on. But they pull harder than ever. And it's only as the Lord becomes... So, so what's... The, so what's what do we tend to do? Well, we tend to say, well, I'll just reform. And what God is saying, no, 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 no. 
<laughs> what you need is something to replace those things, and it's the Lord that's in your heart now that needs to become more precious to you than those idols. Ownership has changed, see, but we, we keep renting the space out. We'll never overcome the old behaviors and the old idols and the things that pull us back until we allow the Holy Spirit access into every single part of our heart. Listen, this is why Paul prayed in Ephesians 3. Just listen to this. It's an amazing prayer. Think about this and remember that he's praying for believers. In Ephesians 3.16, he says this, I'm praying that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, if you're thinking at all, your first question is, I thought Christ was already indwelling my heart if I'm a believer. And that's true. But the word that Paul uses there, the word dwell, so that Christ may dwell in your heart, is a word that means to settle down and be at home. And what he's picturing is here, that what I'm praying for you guys is that Christ will occupy every spare inch of your heart. I don't, you, you can have Christ in there and you can, you, can, you can consign him to the living room and say the rec room is mine. And the music room is mine. And the social room is mine. But victory, beloved, is Jesus everywhere. That's why we need a new dose of the gospel every single day. So that Jesus can go to work and do what we can't do. So that Jesus can go to work and give to, to our minds and to our wills and to our hearts a desire to do, to do the right things that is overwhelmingly positive because we love him, not because we have to. It's not about moral reformation. It's about spiritual transformation. Here's how it works. Tim Keller tells the story. A woman in his church came to him for counseling one day. She'd had a hard life. You know, one man after another in her life. Never married any of them. All abusive, all violent. Most of them ended up in jail at one time or another. So she came to church. She eventually came to faith in Christ. But she said, you know, I realized I still had an inordinate desire for man. I needed a man in my life. I didn't feel like I was worth anything if I didn't have a man in my life. So she went to a Christian counselor. And the Christian counselor said, well, if you want to if you, if you really get over this, you get over your need for men, you need to have something to replace them. You need a career. You need a career. You get out and establish yourself in a career and you won't, you'll be independent of men. You won't need men. Keller, Keller makes this comment. He says, this is where she was brilliant. And, he, and he's right. Because she said to him, you know, Pastor, what... What that counselor was saying to me is, I want you to get rid of your typical feminine idol, men, by replacing it with a typical male idol, career. And she said, I realized that I didn't want to be driven by my need for men, but I also didn't want to be driven by my need to succeed in a career. One was just as bad as the other. Keller said, man, that's, that's wonderful intuition. What have you done? She said, Colossians 3.3. 3. We haven't got there yet. A couple months. May, wherever Jesse is, we're going to get there. Apparently, Colossians 3.3. 3, which says what? My life is hid with Christ in God. He said, well, how does, how does that help? She said, well, every time I see a man and I, and I look and I'd like to go over and start flirting with him, she said, in my heart, and under my breath, I say to myself, Colossians 3.3, 3, and that reminds me that, yes, I want a man, but that's not my life anymore. Men aren't my life. Christ is my life now. I don't want men to be my life anymore. I want Christ to be my life. I want to love Christ more. Men are the past. Christ is the present. Beloved, she couldn't have been more right. That's what this passage in Luke is teaching us. It needs to be Christ front and center to replace the idols. How do you do that? Well, you have to do the Christian, the Christian disciplines, right? You have to be in the Word. You have to be praying. You have to be giving yourself daily and minute by minute to the, 
ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life so that you, pretty soon you can't think of anything, you can't do anything without thinking about how Christ would look at this thing, how Jesus would contemplate this, what it, what it would look like to Christ to see this movie, what it would look like to Christ to go to this place, what it would, how Christ would feel about this, and pretty soon Christ is front and center. You can't replace idols with evil, you replace Christ with, uh, idols with God. I said that wrong. You can't replace idols with good, you replace idols with God. Moral transformation will never get you there. Spiritual transformation will. So it's not about moral transformation. It's about spiritual transformation. Verse 27. As he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you were nursed. That's kind of an interesting throw in at this point in the, in the uh, proceedings, right? But you know, Luke's gospel more than any other shows us the tremendous love and respect and tenderness that Jesus had toward women and how they responded to him. Remember how we saw in Luke 8, a whole contingent of women was part of his entourage that followed him around. We see it at the cross. This woman has been taking it all in. She's been watching closely as Jesus counters every single opportunity that his enemies have to try and bring him down and try and trap him. He is always ahead of them. She's seen the healings. She's seen the compassion. She's seen the love which which he expresses himself. She's seen the spiritual realities that he handles so easily with comments that go, go beyond anything that you could ever have by means of human perception. And in a society which, where a mother's value was, was largely you know, dependent on the accomplishments of her son, she, she couldn't help but blurt out, wow, your mother, what a privileged woman she is. She meant it as a great compliment. And he took it as such. But he didn't just leave it there. Jesus didn't just leave it there. He elevated it. He takes it to another level and he makes this amazing observation that teaches a great truth that's very applicable to us as well. He says, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Jesus liked what she said. He didn't reprove her speech, but he improved it. See, there was a, there was a higher truth here. It's applicable to everybody. Yes, it was a privilege for, Mary's, for, for Mary to be physically the mother of Jesus. Yes, it was a privilege for her to have that physical tie. But what Jesus is saying is, listen, Mary's blessedness wasn't mainly wrapped up in the fact that she, the, 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 it wasn't wrapped up exclusively in the fact that she, had a, that she had a physical tie to him. It wasn't even primarily wrapped up in the fact that she had a physical tie to him, that she was his mother. Mary's blessedness was due to the fact that she heard the word and did it. That's where, that's where blessing comes from. What Jesus is saying here is, listen, this, that's the true source of blessing, not that she was my mother, but that I'm her savior. Turn, turn back with, with me to Luke 1. <clears throat> Remember, right after Gabriel has announced to Mary that she's gonna become the mother of Jesus, Remember what she says? She makes this amazing statement, Luke 1. She first asks, well, how's this going to be since, since I'm a virgin? And the angel tells her, well, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, verse 35. Therefore, the child to be born is to be called Holy, the Son of God. Verse 37, for nothing is impossible with God. But look at verse 38. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. She heard the word, and she did the word, and she was far more blessed for that fact than just that Jesus was her physical child. 
physical tie is temporary. The spiritual tie is forever. Remember when she went down to see Elizabeth, she, she, she made up this great hymn, verses 46 and 47. Look, look what part of that hymn is that she says. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord, the end of verse 46. And my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. I don't know how much Jesus, uh, Mary, understood about the son that was born to her, but she understood this much. She knew that somehow he was going to be her Savior. And the Bible tells us that she was more blessed because she did what the Word of God was than she was because she was Jesus' mother. That's amazing to think about because the implication is this. That means that we today who have never seen Jesus in the flesh can be more blessed than those who did if we hear and obey and they did not and many didn't. That's the only way we can move from the empire of darkness to the empire of light. That leads to permanent change from the inside out, spiritual transformation rather than temporary change on the outside Moral reformation. And that's why Jesus says, turn to Luke 8. Remember what Jesus said there, Luke 8, verse 21. When his mother and brothers are seeking him and the crowd comes and says, hey, your, your family wants you. Your mother and brothers are out there. And Jesus says what? Verse 21, Luke 8, 21. He says, my mother and brothers... My mother and brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. You say, well, the doing sounds like moral reformation. No, 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 not this kind of doing. Remember how, how Jesus told him in John 6, what is, what is it to do the works of God? He says, believe in him who sent, that he sent. That's to do the works of God. And then as you do that, <clears throat> As you believe in him, he transforms you from the inside out and you become a new person. You become a different person. That's why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that if we are in Christ, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. You become a Christian, beloved, the battle is really on, right? But it's not about reformation. It's about regeneration. It's about new birth. It's about letting Jesus come in and change us from the inside out. That's why Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, if anyone will come after me, let him take up his cross daily and follow me. Daily, daily, daily living the gospel. This isn't some work that we can do. It is nothing less than death to self so that he can make us alive to him. You know, the amazing thing is when Jesus comes in and we really do just give it to him, all of a sudden we begin to want way more than we ever thought we could. We begin to want to do the right things. We begin to want them more than we want the other stuff. And the more we concentrate on him, the more that is true. But moral reformation is a deadly alternative. Robert Morgan was a pastor who invited a young man named Mark Sloan to come into his home. Mark was a he was, a, he was an alcoholic, he was a drug addict, addict to cocaine. As he was getting out of rehab, Morgan and his family invited Mark to come and live with them. And for the first few months, everything went great. Mark got himself cleaned up. He was a different person, he went to church, he got a job. He seemed to be, to all outward appearances, seemed to be doing very well. Until one morning they got up and Mark wasn't there. He'd just plain gone. And that was the start of literally years of a cycle where they would go out and find Mark wherever it was he was, whatever pit he had climbed back into. He would promise to reform. He would come back. He would live okay for a while and then he would just disappear again one day. And they kept putting up with this for years. The last time it happened, Mark, Robert found Mark in a basement across town. He was, he was in abject despair. He felt like he had done this so many times. God couldn't possibly forgive him. He was hating his life. He believed that there was no way it was ever going to come right. 
He'd done everything that he knew to get over this problem, not realizing it was all moral reformation. His eyes were glazed over, his words were slurred, Robert says, as he talked to him that day. He said, you know what, there's enough cocaine in this apartment to kill an elephant. My body can't stand much anymore. A day or two, it'll all be over. You'll forget about me in a few weeks and we'll all be better off. It's meant to be. Just let it be. Let me go. What would you say? Morgan said, I didn't know what to say. I'd said everything that I knew to say. But he said, what I did was I pulled out one more of the 31,173 bullets in the Bible. That's all the verses that are in the Bible. This one happened to be 2 Peter 3, 8. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He said, you may think it needs to end this way, Mark, but God doesn't. God just wants you to repent. God just wants to move into your life. God just wants to take you over. He said, no sin is too great. No condition is too long. You can't do it too many times for God to forgive. But you have to actually ask him in. He said, a flicker of hope registered in Mark's eyes. It was very faint but unmistakable. He said, I repeated the verse, and he listened as if trying to grasp a straw blowing past him. Well, Mark grasped that straw. He heard the word, and for the first time, he did the word. And instead of trying moral reformation, he invited Jesus into his life, spiritual transformation. And that's exactly what happened. It's not easy. It doesn't happen overnight. We often go back to the, to the things that have pulled us down, right? But beloved, you keep working at it. You keep giving yourself to the Lord. And the Lord takes you and remakes you like he did Mark. He became a new creation. He became a dedicated, long-term, sober Christian, a leader in the church, a drug addict, every bit as close to Christ as his own mother was. It's not about moral reformation, beloved. That's a 360 degree turn right back to where you started. It's about spiritual transformation. It's about acknowledging I can't do this. It's about repenting and turning it over to Christ and saying I'm not, I can't do this myself but I'm willing for you to do it in and through me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we have such a great Savior. I thank you for the privilege of knowing you. We're disappointed, Father, that we do so often find ourselves back uh, tracking with some of the old behaviors, some of the old habits, some of the old ways of thinking. We realize that you've given us your word, you've given us your Holy Spirit, all the means of grace by which you would bring us back. Help us to take advantage of those. Help us to use them for your glory so that you can transform us from the inside out. Father, I don't know who's here today that needs to be committing their life to you. Never really come to faith in Christ and as your word talks about you standing at the door and knocking, I pray that they will open the door and say yes. Pray for those who are in Christ, but they are struggling. I pray that you will give them victory. I pray that the day will come when they look back and they say, yes, I am not the person I was before by the grace of God. He's transformed me. Lord, just give wonderful victories all around us so that the name of Jesus Christ would be lifted up, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.